Happy Sabbath, Saints. Today we are going to have our sermon online and it's uh, good to be with you. Unfortunately, we cannot be together, but it's always good to be in the house of the Lord in whichever form we may take. Now, imagine, let's take this imaginary scenario. Imagine, if you will, that you are with your friend. You're at your friend's house and you're hanging out, you're doing what friends do, you're talking, you're chatting, you know, watching television, listening to music, all those things that friends do. Then your friend says to you, you know what, I just remembered I need to take my dog outside. So they say, can you just excuse me for a minute? So they go, they get their dog and they go outside. Then they get outside, they open the door, then they, as they are getting outside, they see a snake. And they're like, Ooh, they grab their dog, they rush back inside, they close the door. And they come upstairs to you and they say, and then when they get to you, then you say to them, you know what, I feel like I need to get some air. I'll just step outside for a minute. Then your friend says to you, okay. Then you go downstairs, you go outside, and sure enough, that snake is out there waiting, and you get bitten by the snake, you rush back into the house, you're screaming, you're frantic, you go to your friend and you say, I just got bitten by a snake outside. And then your friend says, oh, yeah, I, I saw it when, when I was outside. And wouldn't you be like, but, but why didn't you help me? Why didn't you do, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you tell me? And then your friend might say, oh, well, I saw the snake and I believed it to be a dangerous situation, but I didn't want to impose my beliefs on you. And then you might say something like, but but you could, now I'm going to die and you could have prevented it. That's an interesting scenario, isn't it? Anyway, let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before your throne of grace this Sabbath morning, praising your name and worshiping you. Lord, we want to thank you for bringing us all together this morning. Lord, we just ask that you speak to us, Lord. May the words that proceed from my mouth, may they, may they be words that are coming straight from your throne of grace, Lord. May I not be heard, but your voice be heard, Lord, your words be heard. We ask all these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the last time I preached, we talked about identity. Who am I? And we came to the conclusion that we are children of God. Now, someone may ask, naturally from that is, but what does that mean exactly to be children of God? And then we may say, well, it means that we believe in God. And someone may ask, but what does that mean? And then you may say, well, to believe in God is to mean that I trust in God. I trust in him more than I trust in anyone or anything else. Um, almost to say I have faith in him. In fact, it is the same to say I have faith in him. And this faith that we're talking about, it is not in believing something that you do not have good reason to believe, no. It is believing in something that you have good reason to believe in. That is why in the Bible it actually says, come, let us reason together, showing that it is reasonable. It makes sense to talk about this, to make sense to believe in this, to make sense to believe in God. And so, okay, then the next question that would proceed, okay, you have this faith, this trust in God, but then, why? Then, and that is the title of our sermon this Sabbath. Why I believe in God. Why I believe. Now, for me, if we were in church, I would probably be asking some of you why you believe. So you can just ask yourself, why do you believe? Why do I believe? For me, the short answer is because it makes sense. It's that simple. It makes sense. That's why I believe in God. Now, the long answer would involve explaining what we mean when we say God. Because we may be talking about two different things or two different people. And you find this is, I found that this is so important because when we, just by explaining comprehensively, describing, defining who God is, we find that a lot of those difficult questions that we may be encountering, that we may get asked, seem to fall away by themselves, simply by understanding who we are talking about when we say we believe in God and the, which God we are talking about. Now, take for example, 
you someone asks you um, where did God come from you believe in God where did he come from now if you understand like we look at the Bible the very first words in the Bible Genesis 1 verse 1 and it says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth in the beginning God so right away you understand that in the beginning there was God so if someone asked where did God come from you're talking about a place and a place is a thing and anything that has been created or that is it that exists came from God so then you cannot then ask the question where did God come from because all things come from him so automatically you see that that question does not even make sense to ask when you understand who God is if he was from the beginning so you see it's very important to understand the kind of God or the God of whom we speak when we say we believe in God now one Christian writer described God this way or defined God this way and he says God is a person without a body i.e. a spirit who necessarily is eternal as an everlasting he is perfectly free he is omnipotent meaning he is all powerful he is omniscient meaning he is all knowing and he is perfectly good as in he is morally good and he is the creator of all things like as we just found out in from genesis 1 verse 1 he in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth so everything anything that you see god created and so we can see that and i like this definition because it is quite comprehensive and we can actually say but okay where does this definition come from and if we look into our bibles we can find all these various aspects of god coming out and there are so many verses that tell us and we will just touch on a few of them Let's go to 1 John 4, verse 8, and it tells us, But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So God is loving. So we, all, we know that God is loving. And then we looked at Psalms 34, verse 8, and it reads, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So we see that God is good. And it's saying he's perfectly good in character, in moral, in moral character. And then if we look at Matthew 5, verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Your heavenly father is perfect. He is perfection. Again, we see that God is perfect. And then if we look at Hebrews 4, verse 13, it reads, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account nothing in all creation is hidden from god's sight he is omniscient he is all knowing there is nothing that goes on that has ever gone on that will ever go on that he does not know he is all knowing and if we look at jeremiah 32 27 it says Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, and there is, is there anything too hard for me? Is, also, is there anything too hard? Meaning there is nothing too hard for him. He can do anything. He is all powerful. God is all powerful. He can do anything. And if we look at Revelation 22, God is eternal. And it reads, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning and the end. He is everlasting. He is eternal, the Alpha and the Omega. So we can see that this is, this. we find this definition of God that we found, that it is all encompassing and we find this definition in the Bible. These various aspects and characteristics of God can be found in our Bibles. Now, and this is the God that I believe in. Now, someone may be thinking, but have you always thought of it this way? Have you always believed this even from your youth or from whenever? And the short answer, in fact, the, the answer simply is no. I did not always think of this or even know, be so much aware of it. Actually, I was raised, just to give you a bit of a background about myself, I was raised as a Christian in a Christian family. And... But what you would call in this setup, in the Adventist setup, you would say I was raised as a Philistine. But granted, I was a Christian. I believed in God. It was a, yeah, just a very 
a laid back kind of situation. We believe in God, yes, and every Sunday, every now and then, Sundays we go to church and that was it. And you could say my relationship with God or my, my relationship, my drawing closer to the Lord was more of a gradual progression. As I became a young adult, I slowly and slowly got closer and closer, got to develop that relationship with the Lord. It was a gradual process. It was, you, you, it was nothing like you would say, like Paul, who was more of a rather U-turn, a 90 degree turns kind of a situation of a sudden change. So mine was gradual, as I was saying. And um, now I got to a point where I find that, okay, I, I have been drawn closer to this God, the Lord put people in, in my life and I slowly found my way in this particular church and I just got to a point where I did this all this these all, all these things about God and Christ made sense to me. And that was that for me. It was enough. And that was that. Now, what I didn't know at the time, and I only found this out later, was that I was not able to translate or communicate, relate this same belief of mine and this reason for my belief to someone else. You know, in short, to go and carry, like it says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. I was not able to do this in a manner that even I would consider convincing. I was convinced and that was enough. But to move to the next step, as Christ commanded us to, I was not able to do that. And I found out this one time back when I was in Mozambique and I used to play soccer with um, some other Zimbabweans. We had a team of Zimbabweans. Guys would meet up on Sundays and we'd have a game with other teams. And one time before a game, one of our teammates, I don't know how the conversation just got to there. And then he just said, you know what? I don't believe in God. And, you know, we were all, we were quite a few of us and we were like, what? Everybody was stumped. Like, how can you not believe in God? You know, we were all raised the same way, all similar backgrounds. We all come from Zimbabwe. We, we believe in God. It, it, it's just as a matter of course. That's how we were raised, all of us. And he just said, no, um, I don't believe in God. And we, we just could not believe it. And we're like, but look at you. You're a successful guy. You've got a good job. You've got a nice family. You're well off. You're well educated. And you, you don't believe in God. You, you've been blessed by God to have all these things. And he said, no, it's my hard work. And this really left us stumped, you know, and saying it may not, I understand in the Australian context, it may not be that dramatic to hear someone doesn't believe in God. But when you, where we come from, pretty much everybody believes in God. In maybe the denomination you attend may be different, but you all believe in God and Christ. So it, this was really quite something, you know. So yeah, this really stumped us. And we, the unfortunate thing was we all failed to really defend our position or to really give him good reasons for believing. We just, you know, like, hey, we believe this. And I, I think that was an unfortunate situation. And it got to the point where we did what we who believe, the all of us Christians who profess to be Christians in this discussion or argument, as you may call it, we did what most people do when they're losing an argument. We dismissed the other guy we called him crazy like you're crazy oh, this guy is just crazy he doesn't believe in god how can he not believe we had no real reasons we just rather just dismissed him because we could not say anything that could hold any substance or water i mean we all believed but we could not defend our position and i think this was an unfortunate situation to find ourselves in now interestingly enough i also take um the pathfinders for sabbath school lessons every sabbath morning and there is if you are a pathfinder and you're listening to this you know and if you if you're not a pathfinder whenever i mention connor the pathfinders are usually get quite uncomfortable they do not like it whenever i mention connor and if you're not a pathfinder connor is a an imaginary young boy let's call him and he is the same, he is the pathfinder age, like preteens, 11, 12, 13, whatever. And he is also, he's imaginary, and he's the same age as the pathfinders, and he is, he is a non-believer. So, whenever, I always ask them, one time I was asking the boys, let's say you, if you meet up with Connor, how would you um, 
carry out the Great Commission to someone like Connor? What would you say to him? What would you do? And it was interesting that I was able, I was fortunate enough to ask each and every one of them at different times where one could not hear the answer of the other. And interestingly, they all gave the same answer. They said we would take him to camp and there they would tell him everything he needs to know to become a Christian. And I found this interesting. They all said the same answer, but they did not discuss it, which has been found this really interesting. And then I said, okay, but what if we're in a situation where there is no camp or camp is far off or there won't be a camp for any time soon or the camp is just passed and there's nothing. And they said, uh, in that case, we would take him to an elder or to the priest. And I was like, hmm, okay. So it, I really saw that the problem of Connor really what did not appear too much to be a problem for them or if it was a problem that they saw, it was something that they were quite happy to see passed on to someone else. Now, if the and bearing in mind these are these are young men who are young boys who are intelligent and articulate, very intelligent young men, and yet they cannot do this. And I found and, and I was really reminded of my own situation when I was back in Mozambique that you believe all of these things, but you cannot communicate them and you expect someone else to do it when clearly we have been commissioned to do this. Each and every one of us should be equipped and able to do this. Now, if these young ones cannot do it, then that fault lies not at their feet, but at ours. It is our duty to make sure that everyone is prepared. But if they are not prepared, it may also be because we as the grown-ups, as the adults, are not prepared. And now just imagine, most of us are Christians and we profess to believe in the Lord. And then... Some of us may have been Christians, I don't know, for five years, 10 years, 15, 20, maybe more. Who knows? You know how long you have been uh, a believer. Now imagine if you went to, let's say, a doctor's office and you had a problem and the doctor said, this doctor's got 20 years experience and he says, ah, you know what? I don't know what is wrong with you. How would you what did you think of that doctor? Now, in hindsight, I think maybe the example of a doctor is not the best since doctors are usually referring people to for second and third and fourth opinions. But you get the idea. Whatever job you do, if you were to be in that position and you've been in that, you encounter someone with that with 20 years experience, 10 years experience, 15 years experience, and they, and they do not know how to do their job. What would you think? What would you think of that person? So how, uh, how can we, how are we seen if we are Christians for however long we've been and we cannot defend our position, we cannot speak for Christ, we cannot speak for the good news that we have, that we have received so gladly and so freely. Now, when I look at myself, um, I, I, like I said before, Christianity makes sense. That's why I believe Christianity makes sense. And even when you compare it with other world religions, Christianity makes a lot of sense. It make, makes the most sense, in fact. And it tells me that um, to love my, my fellow brothers and sisters. And not because I am particularly loving or particularly good, because I am not. I know that I am not good. But it tells me to love because Christ loved me and laid down his life for me. And that good news, that message of salvation, we should be taking to our fellow brothers and sisters. And we should be acting as people who believe this message that Christ indeed did lay down his life for us. Um, and to just see, like, I look at my own experience as a father, and I see, and I look at my children, I'm a father of three, and I look at them, and I see that we are sinful by nature. I look at my children and I have never had to teach them not, I've always had to teach them not to be selfish. I've always, I've, it's never been there, and to say, don't be selfless, be share, share, sharing is caring, we always have to teach them that. It's never the other way around. You, because you find that naturally we are born with that sinful nature. So we see that when the Bible tells us that we are sinful by nature, we see that this is true, and we see it in ourselves, and in, even in the young ones as well. It's something that is inherent. So we find that we do need the Lord. Now, I have conducted what you might call a very rudimentary or basic 
um, study of the world's religions. And I can tell you that they all say different things about the main questions of life, the questions of what you might call uh, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny, the origin of life, the meaning of life, right and wrong, which is morality and destiny. Where are we going when it all ends? The religions of the world say different things about these great questions of life. And what I find is that if all these religions say different things, I'm not, I'm not the cleverest person. You don't have to even be the cleverest person to find that if all these religions say different things, they cannot all be true, as some people like to say, that oh, no, all religions are basically the same. They are not basically the same. They say different things. And if they say different things, they cannot all be true. Now, it is quite possible that they may all be wrong, but it is not possible that they are all true. So, with that in mind, I turn to Christianity, the religion into which I was born. I had, you could, my, my, someone might even argue that I had no choice, I was born into it. But then I have grown up into it and consciously made the decision to be a Christian as an adult and I believe in what Christianity says. And I find that Christianity is true and it tells me to love, to live with love and with respect for one another and to be able to go and carry the Great Commission and to uh, always give a reason for the hope that I have and to do it with love and respect. To do it with love and respect. I can say that I am now at a stage where I can give a reason for the hope that I have, but I believe the Lord is still working on me on the love and respect part of that command. Now, there is this one um, Russian astronaut. He's also an atheist, who happens to be an atheist. And he said something that was quite interesting. He said, either there is a God or there isn't. Both of these scenarios are frightening. Because if there is a God, then we better find out who he is and find out what he wants and do what he says. If there is no God, however, then we are in trouble because we are hurtling into space at 66,000 miles per hour and nobody is in charge. And I think that is self-explanatory. If there is a God, either there is a God or there isn't. Both of those situations are frightening. If there is a God, then we need to find out what he is saying and do what he is saying. If there is no God, then this is the animal kingdom, the survival of the fittest, the weak are destroyed, the weak suffer, the weak are, they have no chance, there's no hope for the weak. And in that case, when the Lord does return, as he promised he will, then it will either be a great day or a frightening day. And it will be both, depending on where we stand on this situation of belief in him. Now, imagine a scenario where someone is standing on, in, on the road or something on the highway and a bus is rushing towards them. Wouldn't you shout to them or even run and jump and get in their way and push them out of the way so that they are not hit by that bus? And that is the same scenario we have here. We know that there is great danger at the end when the end does inevitably come. And we are commissioned to go out there and to help our fellow brothers to tell them of this great impending danger. And the least we can do, the very least we can do is do it with some energy and some gusto, the very least we can do. And it is just like, if we go back to the scenario that I opened this um, talk with, where you're at your friend's house. Now imagine that same scenario and your friend tells you they're going to take their dog outside. They do go take their dog outside they see the snake, they rush back in the house. But this, and then this time they come back up. And then you again tell them, you want to go outside to get some fresh air. But this time, this time your friend tells you, please, I beg of you, do not go outside. There is a snake out there. You will be in great danger. I fear for your life. Please do not go outside. Now, in this scenario, you still have the choice and the freedom to say, you know what, forget you, I am still going outside, despite the danger. 
Now, in that situation, you what do we say of your friend? Your friend has acted out of love, regardless of how you have received that message. And you would expect your friend to be frantic about it and to be really going on and begging you, please, 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 almost to the point of harassment. And you may feel you are being harassed, but that person is acting out of genuine love for your sake, for your life. Now, in the world today that we live in, unfortunately, we have reached a situation in our, we can maybe say the, 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 the culture the, of the day is that we want to maybe be polite, you want to say it, we, are, we, we do not want to offend, we can say no, I do not want to push my beliefs on you. But like we say, if a bus is rushing into you, you would rush into someone and push them out of the way. It would be even a violent push, but you are saving the person's life. And I think the least we can do for our fellow brothers and sisters out there and for ourselves is to act in accordance with the will of the Lord who has sent us on this great commission. That is the least we can do. And, you know, in the Bible it says, by their deeds, you will know them. This is in Matthew 7, 16. By their deeds, you will know them. By their deeds, you will know them. What are our deeds? What are our deeds? Are we acting as children of God? As we, are we acting as people who believe in God? Are we acting? And are not just in how we behave, how we carry ourselves, but also in carrying the message of salvation to the world. Are we, do we feel it a burden? Are we doing it that, ah, oh, no, I don't want to bother someone, I don't want, and I think that is the unfortunate situation we find ourselves in. But given the gravity of the situation, we really need to be more vehement with our message because we are acting in love as we have been commanded to do. Now, basically, after all this, this is why I believe. I believe in a God as we described above. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is all. He is loving. He is perfectly good. He is eternal. That is the God I believe in. And this same God acted out of love. He sent His Son on this earth so that He might give up His life, that we may be saved from our sinful ways. That we may be saved from our sinful ways. And by this, I know that we can have eternal life. And with that, he has commanded us to go out into the world and to do likewise. Because for me to be here today, someone carried the great commission that I could hear that message of salvation so I could be here today. And I, the least I can do is from that love that emanated from Christ is do the same and go out into the world and in love spread that message of the love and salvation that is offered in Christ Jesus that we can only find in Christ Jesus. And that is why I believe in God. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word.